funding for Indian Pride is provided by the Seminole Tribe of Florida, the Forest County Potawatomi Tribe, National City, the Otto Bremer Foundation, and the members of Prairie Public. On this episode of Indian Pride, we will look at American Indian culture, traditions, and celebrations, hear a story about why you should obey your parents, and enjoy Upper Midwest drummers and powwow dancers. Hi, I'm Junie K. Randall, and welcome to Indian Pride. After 500 years, the American Indian continues to nurture their rich history and culture. Indian Pride invites you into the world of these traditions and celebrations. Our last speaker, Fidelia Fielding, she died in 1908, our last fluent speaker. Um, we had a lot of tribal members speaking a little here and there, but in Connecticut, you know, we went through a period where it was illegal to speak our language. It was illegal to wear our clothes, our regalia, you know, our, our feathers and leathers. So we had to dress like everybody else. Uh, and that's why we're so happy when we have our wigwam or our powwow. Some people call it a powwow, we call it a wigwam. When we put on our regalia and we dance, every time our foot hits the ground, we're honoring our ancestors. We're wearing the clothes to honor our ancestors. And then the language, the songs that we sing, um, some of the newer songs that we sing now are in the Mohegan language. Our tribe was growing, people were being born, uh, people were coming back home. And some of our tribal members were born in Hawaii and lived there their whole life, but they were all coming home now that things were changing here. So my job was to educate everybody, get them involved, and get the culture and the spirituality of our tribe deep into their hearts. I really remember is the burning of the witch. We know that the many stories are about the witch. And there was an old couple that lived west of here. And they really loved to put that on. They would be feasting on jackrabbit or cotton tail, beans and tortillas and the man would wear wigs made of horse hair, you know, long, and they'd wear red cloth. And so they'd start singing, using the gourd, singing about the witch, you know, how, how she ate children, how she would lure them to her, her cave. They'd pile up weeds, brush, a big pile, and then when, he, when the song comes to that where they burn the witch, then they would burn that, that brush. And they would go up in flames. So that was the, the grand finale to that uh, celebration. And then after that, when they get through eating, then the dancing would begin and they would dance all night. As an Indian, we always uh, wear a feather. That bird that the feather comes from is our messenger, the eagle. He's a messenger. When we pray, he's the bird that can see the farthest and fly the highest. So he's the messenger come Shkabewas. So when he hears our prayers and he takes the rest away to, uh, to the great spirit, so that's why we wear this feather. It's, it protects us from day to day. The newest, and I believe the most beautiful museum in our nation's capital, is the National Museum of the American Indian. The museum celebrates the rich history, culture, and traditions of 562 Indian nations. It is an honor to welcome to Indian Pride Dr. Richard West, director of this wonderful museum. 
Dr. West is a citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma and a peace chief of the Southern Cheyenne. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. West. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. American Indian culture is alive and well, right? I believe that. I really do believe that. Give us a little bit of uh, history of how we were able to sustain the American Indian culture for over 500 years. Well, I think it has a great deal to do with the, the traditions that through the years bound us together as Native communities and Native peoples. I really think about it in personal terms almost. I remember growing up in the state of Oklahoma, which was relatively friendly territory for Indians. There are a lot of us down there. Um, but I compare it to what I see happening today, and there's a big difference. There really is. I think that there is a resurgence in pride in the traditions and values of Native peoples by Native peoples themselves, and I think that's terribly important. I see a great change since I grew up. Uh, there is really what I would call a cultural renaissance going mm -hmm. on in Indian country right now. How did they keep it alive a long time ago when, when it wasn't cool to be Indian or people did not even want to say they were Indian, especially if they didn't look Indian, but yet there were the diehard, you know, Indian people that, mm. that sang and kept the language alive. How did they sustain themselves? Well, it's, it's interesting you should say that because now, of course, the problem is everybody wants to be Indian, <laughs> including some of those who are not. It right. really is very cool to be Indian. But I think the way that they did it is the following. There were certain ceremonies and traditions that held Native peoples together. I think, for example, of the Sundance of the Southern Cheyenne, right. a very uh, important religious and spiritual ceremony for lots of Plains tribes, including the Southern Cheyenne. And for a long time, dating from the late 19th century until probably the 50s or 60s of the 20th century, that ceremony simply had to go underground because it was not permitted formally by regulation, uh, federal regulation at the time. But it did. That's the point. We didn't stop doing it. We just did it in other ways. So now the ceremony still sits with us and we still perform it every summer come the summer solstice. And it's that kind of sustaining force that I think has held Native peoples together. Language is obviously also a critical factor because there's so much culture that is bound up in Native languages. And to the extent that they still exist, even if threatened at the present time, it's very, very important. What is one of the most profound memories that you carry when you were putting the National Museum of American Indians together about some of those ceremonies that, you know, we thought didn't exist? Well, I'll tell you what was most important to me in putting together the National Museum of the American Indian as it relates to what we're talking right. about. And that is the fact that unless I could have envisioned the National Museum of the American Indian as an international institution of living cultures, not just something <laughs> about the ethnographic remnant that existed a century ago or something, but as about living cultures and communities, I wouldn't be sitting here across the table from you right now. So from the very beginning, the National Museum of the American Indian committed itself to sustaining and maintaining native culture and communities into the future. It's through what we call the fourth museum of the National Museum of the American Indian. As you probably know, we have sites in New York and two in Washington, D.C., okay. but this fourth museum is an effort to bring the National Museum of the American to Indian country so that we can maintain Native cultures into the future. So how did you work to preserve the American Indian, <coughs> Indian culture and heritage when you were actually going into the museum after it was you know built and then how did you decide what you were going to put in there and what criteria uh, it must have been overwhelming well there there are a lot there's lots of indian country <laughs> there's no question <laughs> of that exactly over 500 communities sitting out there but the fact is that first of all we consulted directly with those communities to try to determine how it is they saw what was needed uh, to maintain culture and community into the future. And that had a great deal to do with what we did at the National Museum of the American Indian. The fundamental decision was made to devote our resources, both financial and human resources and our own expertise, to this particular effort to sustain community culture in contemporary Native communities. And we do it through any number of ways, loaning objects, traveling exhibits. We have an electronic connection to all of Indian country. 
that allows us to go back and forth to Indian country on an interactive, real-time basis. That's how you bring the National Museum of the American Indian to Indian country so that it sustains that which has been there for so long. And then it becomes an educational tool for America to understand the history and the modern day Indian as well, right? Absolutely, because um, I want to take the museum beyond our four walls in Washington right. and New York City. And then what are some of the uh, tr Indian traditions that were lost? <clears throat> well, I think that one of the biggest casualties in all of this is simply language. And if you lose language, you lose a lot because so much in language describes that which is ceremonial. Um, I know, for example, again, amongst the Cheyenne, uh, at one point, even though it is very much a private, almost secret ceremony, parts of the Sundance were actually committed to video, simply because we felt we were losing so much uh, in the way of those who knew the songs, who knew the language that went with the um, conduct of that ceremony. And so we felt we had to do something to try to stave it off. So there are ceremonies that we have lost. I, I, you can talk to any Native community, and they will say that there are certain things we don't know anymore. But there has been an effort in the name of cultural preservation, using even sources that we sometimes look to scans at, anthropological writings and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. to try to reconstruct some of the ceremonies that bound Native communities. Um, when we're talking about celebrations in, in mm -hmm. Indian country, what kind of celebrations, uh, when you were researching all, uh, everybody uh, <laughs> in Indian country, what were some of the most unique celebrations that you thought were really heartfelt? Well, there's some that are, are better known, and they're not unimportant. For example, powwows, which everybody associates with right. Indian country, probably almost too much as though everybody does that. Well, everybody doesn't. It's basically a, pl a plains gathering. But the fact is, it has historical bases. Powwows come from the practice of Plains Indians way back when, even those who were not friendly with one another, gathering together once a year to socialize, to dance, to conduct ceremony, to have songs, all of that that goes into human relationships, if you will. Right. But there are a number of those that are not as well known that are equally important, whether it's the green corn dance of the uh, five civilized tribes and some of them in Oklahoma. Um, there are any number of these kinds of ceremonies I think that there is a renewed interest in that continue to go forward. There is an effort, for example, using resources that sit in museums like the National Museum of the American Indian to come back, if you will, to gaining knowledge of songs and ceremonies that go along with those songs. That's what's, that's what's really important in, in my view because that is what will keep Native communities alive and well into the 21st century. Well, uh, let's do a little bit of celebrating for the 21st century. Give us the picture. What's going to happen to Indian country as they now recapture their language and their celebrations? And what do you see for the 21st century for the children? Well, I, I take this view of it. I'm not a Pollyanna. I think <laughs> that, that Indian country has lots of very real challenges. And many of them are social and economic, but they are also cultural. And what pleases me most about what Indian tribes are doing now is that they are devoting resources that they have to the maintenance of culture. I remember somebody telling me when I was young, you know, you can't eat culture. Um, you've got to be able to eat uh, if you're going to have culture. And I realize the importance of that, but I see historic preservation, cultural preservation offices cropping up all over Indian country at this time. Right. And I think that's terribly, terribly important. So I think that that kind of thing will happen. Look, I see it this way. If we got through the past 500 years, I have no doubt that we're capable of sustaining ourselves into the future. What I do think must happen is that Native peoples must learn to be able to cope with the fact that we're no longer a cultural island. Uh, some people say, well, you know, Rick, it's interesting, you're kind of from two places. Well, I'm really not. I'm from one place. I'm, I'm a Cheyenne. But I go many places. And our trick for the future, as far as I'm concerned, and our maintenance mechanism for the future will be that we need to make sure we know where we are from and therefore where we are going in fundamental cultural terms. But at the same time, we have to be able to cope with cultures that are not our own. Well, the rich culture and traditions of American Indians are an integral part of Indian society. 
and it's been an honor to have you with us today. You are Mr. Indian Pride, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed being here. You know, most of our tribal stories have a, a moral, have a teaching to it. And this is about uh, Beat Out D with Little Skunk. And Little Skunk, one time, he heard his parents telling him, you know, stay away from over there, it's dangerous. Uh, that you can get hurt over there. But Beat Out D with, he didn't like to listen. And so one day when his folks were gone, Beat Out D with, boy, he went over there, the hot daku, and he got over there and he wanted to get some berries. And when he got there to get those berries, there was a big rock that was in his way. And so Peter Adiwa couldn't go around it, couldn't go over it, so he tunneled under it. And that rock was real hot. Sakuru, the sun, had heated it up. And so when he got under it and he got to the other side, well, he ate all those berries. And his kadaru was just full. His stomach was full. And finally, when he got done, he came back. He went back under that rock. And he come back to his home. And when he got there, his Atias and his Atira, his mother and his father, asked him, Beat out, with where'd you go? Where were you? And he said, I didn't go anywhere. And they said, Beat out, with you're not being truthful. And he looked at them and they said, well, how do you know? And he says, because there's something wrong with you. Come here. And when he came over there to them, they said, Siksa, come here. Beat out, with stood there. He said, you know what? You're back. It's all white. Did you go over there and get burned by that rock? And Peter Adiwit had to put his head, and he said, How? Yes, I did. And Peter Adiwit learned a great lesson that day, that when your parents tell you something, you need to do it, because you can't get anything by your parents. heartbeat of most American Indian tribes can be felt in the powerful sound and rhythms of the drum. Today, our spirits are lifted by the awesome voices of the Iyabe drum and singing group from Red Lake Nation in Minnesota. Joining Iyabe is some colorful North Dakota powwow dancers. Yeah. <laughs> 
like to thank all of our special guests for sharing their gifts and talents. We invite you to join us next time as we present another great showcase of Indian pride. Whenever you get a chance, do something kind for a child. Bye-bye for now. Funding for Indian Pride is provided by the Seminole Tribe of Florida, the Forest County Potawatomi Tribe, National City, the Otto Bremer Foundation, and the members of Prairie Public.